So next, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists today. We have Camille Holmes, who is the Director of Leadership and Racial Equity Initiative of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. Um, and she came to NLADA from the Center for Law and Social Policy. She is a founding member of the Jamestown Project, serves on the Board of Directors of the Poverty and Race Research Action Council, and is a registered yoga teacher. Next on the panel is Tally Wells, who serves as the Director of the Disability Integration Project at Atlanta Legal Aid Society. He is also the creator of OlmsteadRights.org, which launched last year through a grant from the Legal Services Corporation. And he advocates for individuals with disabilities who are confined in Georgia institutions and nursing homes and individuals at risk of institutionalization. Xander Carson is a project manager at Legal Server and my former colleague at Pro Bono Net, where he was the Law Help Program Coordinator. Before that, he worked for two years as an Equal Justice AmeriCorps Legal Fellow at Legal Assistance of Western New York in Geneva, New York, where he focused on providing holistic representation to those impacted by a criminal record. Finally, I'm Miranda McGelly, the moderator and the Law Help Interactive Program Coordinator at Pro Bono et Net. I previously worked um, at Legal Information for Families Today in New York, managing a volunteer attorney program, and then a bilingual uh, legal information hotline. And again, welcome to all our guests. So on the next side, slide, you'll see our roadmap for today. We'll start things off by providing some definitions on cultural competency and related concepts, and then draw out why cultural competence is relevant to legal technology. Uh, Camille and I will talk a bit about how um, we can think about racial and ethnic diversity in relation to legal technology. After that, we'll hear from Tally, who will walk us through website accessibility and inclusion and his experience with the OlmsteadWrites.org website development process. Xander will next cover gender identity and legal technology and forms. And we'll wrap things up with um, discussion and again encourage you to ask questions and enter questions into the uh, comments box throughout the presentation. We'll pause briefly between each panelist's presentation. Um, so this slide shows our goals for today. Um, and our goals include providing some ideas or ensuring um, that the tech tools that we use and increasingly rely on to provide legal services and access to justice are reflective and inclusive of the diverse populations legal practitioners serve. We will help you identify some best practices when thinking about design and enhancement of technical tools and services that utilize technology with sensitivity to issues like gender identity and expression, as well as racial and ethnic diversity and disability. And uh, Camille will also revisit these goals in the coming slides. Um, so I'll turn things over to her, Camille. Great, hello, how is it? I hope everyone is well. Um, and I am going to talk about culture, inclusion, equity, and legal technology. But um, I wanted to focus on the purpose um, of, of uh, this discussion um, as we're trying to connect technology, make sure we're using technology in a culturally competent, inclusive um, way. Uh, the point is, really to create that inclusive platform that accurately reflects a range, a full range of identities um, and to capture accurate data. Um, often when you're trying to build uh, relationships with communities that uh, are not reflected in your office or communities um, that uh, you're not familiar with, uh, one way to do that is to really just show as an organization that you see that community and the members of that community as a part of the, the total community. They're not an add-on, they're actually a part of, um, a part of the whole. Um, so that's that first why. Why are we doing this? So that people will be able to both um, to see themselves reflected and, and feel connected to the, through the platforms that you're building. Um, second is to capture accurate data. Um, because often if folks don't feel included or if they don't feel um, connected, they're not really going to respond in meaningful ways. 
um, and the way that you put together your platforms um, if they are not um, really including all of the categories, the ways that people self-define, or as many of those as possible, you may be missing some useful data. Um, and finally, once you've collected that data, uh, you can analyze that data to, to determine trends and determine if uh, certain groups are experiencing one type of service versus, an, versus another, determine if um, uh, people in, in one neighborhood or one area or of one particular gender expression or one race or ethnic identity um, are um, being discriminated against or experiencing disparate treatment or disparate outcomes, um, and, then, and then follow up with that. So um, having this uh, platform be inclusive um, is both, it's both a good thing to do, but it's also uh, a way to be strategic and and uh, strategic in your advocacy and to be the a robust advocate. I'm going to go over some definitions. Um, I have uh, found in my experience in the legal aid community and through some research that um, I did through a survey a few years back that uh, people are often conflate terms and uh, don't necessarily make sure that they are uh, understanding those terms uh, in the same way. So I think definitions are really important so that communication can happen and we're not uh, communicating. Uh, while we're thinking we're saying one thing, someone else is hearing another thing because they don't really have the, share the same definition. And yes, diversity is the first uh, um, definition. Diversity is a, use, a word that we've used a lot. I found even in some uh, instances when people say diversity, they mean race um, because depending on where you are in the country, it's less like it's more or less uh, comfortable for people to talk about race. Um, but diversity is really about variety. Um, it's the statistic, statistical presence of a variety of people or things. There are a broad range of types of diversities. Um, you can have racial diversity, ethnic diversity, uh, gender expression diversity, educational background diversity. And um, the idea is really that you want to be specific about the type of diversity that you are focusing on so that you're not um, conflating all these various types of identity or types of, of background. Um, I was with a group um, in Baltimore and I learned, uh, I, they really crystallized for me that diversity should always have a qualifier. So whether it's geographic diversity, racial diversity, diversity of sexual orientation, um, and and or a compilation of those things because these are also intersectional. We have people of color who uh, are transgender and uh, differently abled. We have, um, I mean, we have people who have high educational background and um, uh, low, uh, a lower class background and may speak a different language of origin. We need to think really, be broad in our thinking about diversity and think holistically. Um, my final uh, piece on this side is that my, my pet pee for the year is that only groups can be diverse, people are not. We all use the word uh, diverse candidate. Um, it is, I mean, I've heard it and I've, I've probably used it at one point. It's a shortcut that, but people can bring diversity to a group, but really groups are diverse. People are black, white, Asian, um, differently abled, cisgender, transgender, um, heterosexual, homosexual. They are gay, lesbian, bi, but they're not diverse. <laughs> they may bring a certain type of diversity and groups can be diverse. So inclusion. Um, diversity, I'm going to just mention for a second, is a great thing to aim for. And in uh, settings when people are coming together just for a moment, diversity can bring some great um, benefits. For example, juries that are racially diverse tend to make, um, in, engage in more rigorous uh, analysis and tend to come out with better decisions. But in organizations where people are going to have a long-term relationships or, or in, um, in uh, 
settings where you're really trying to set the stage, diversity without inclusion is a recipe for, for problems. Inclusion is when, um, when something is within the structure. It's more than just numerical representation. It's authentic and empowered participation and a true sense of belonging. So it's the difference between uh, the technology having an add-on to make sure that we're capturing those other people uh, and the technology being developed with those other people so that they are in fact at the center along with everyone else and defining who is at the table and how people conceive of themselves. And so here I, I talk about structural oppression. Often I'm talking about structural racism, but structural racism is a type of structural oppression. And I'm mentioning it here because, I'm talking about it here because the reason that we go through the effort of, of making sure our groups are diverse, making sure that we are inclusive, is often because the world that we live in has actively oppressed and marginalized groups that are different from uh, those groups that have privilege. Um, so structural oppression is the normalization of uh, bunches of dynamics, be it the history of, of um, uh, slavery, genocide, if it's the um, culture of leaders looking a certain way or education being provided at different levels in different parts of the country. Um, these structures routinely advantage privileged groups while uh, routinely disadvantaging um, oppressed groups. And it's something that is perpetuated at multiple levels, at, um, the, um, at the institutional level. I mean, institutions, the way that we interact individually, our attitudes um, within ourselves, and interact with the culture, the larger culture, our history um, and come together to really make sure that those who have continue to have access and those who don't, don't. It's not, um, um, it's important because in order to change this, we have to disrupt the structures of oppression. And that's disrupting, that's disrupting structural racism, structural sexism, structural, um, uh, uh, gender bias, um, and so what you're doing with, the, um, with technology is disrupting that process and actually bringing everyone to the center so that the center is a human however they show up. Equity, um, the def as the definition stated here, the quality, the state quality or ideal of being just and partial or fair, um, it's, uh, to think about this, this is, again, getting to the idea of disruption. So equity, if we have an equitable system, then the outcomes will look different than they do now if the system is currently not equitable. And so it really involves creation, the creation of proactive, reinforce, uh, proactive policies, practices, attitudes that change the way that uh, inequality and inequities are reproduced. So that when, um, let's say, someone comes to the website, they can actually see themselves and not suffer the indignity of having to figure out where they are. Um, it's not something that they have to ask about. It's something that the system's already prepared, uh, prepared for um, and planned for and changed so that uh, uh, that sense of inclusion, that sense of an ability to get the same outcomes as someone else who's similarly situated except for uh, the part of uh, the identity identification that is uh, quote unquote different from the norm and I mean it redefines the norm. This is uh, what we should begin thinking about with, with regard to equity and creating equity um, is, a, is a challenge but I think something that is really exciting to uh, think about and something that we can, we can produce. And so um, cultural competence and cultural humility. We've talked a, a lot about cultural competence. And, um, and if any of you have questions, feel free to send them through to the chat box because it's, it's a lot of um, definitions and talking. But this is about getting us all on the same page so that we can uh, move forward uh, and have real communication. 
um, cultural competence is this idea that we can interact and effect effectively with people from different cultures and different socioeconomic backgrounds. And I have come across this term called cultural humility, which I like a lot more. One, because competence seems like you can actually achieve it. Um, and I know that I will never be competent in someone's culture that is other than my own. Um, I can learn what their ideals are. I can learn um, what, uh, what uh, their expressions of, you know, uh, celebration and grief and, um, and otherwise are, but I really have to rely on them as the expert uh, in their culture. Cultural humility actually gets me to focus on the fact that I have a culture too. Um, I am very, I embrace American culture. I am a black woman and there are uh, cultural aspects to my identity that derive from that. I'm cisgender and that's um, another part of my culture. And me being able to um, know that I have, that I am coming from a culture that causes me to see others as different from me. Being present to that helps me to be open to learning about that other person's culture and learning about um, uh, accepting their expertise in their own culture. And so it's, it's really about um, uh, uh, looking at ourselves and uh, being open to that uh, to learning about how our culture shows up and how we're communicating that, and then interrupting power imbalances, um, developing partnerships with people and groups that advocate for themselves, and honoring their um, understanding of and, and knowledge of their culture, and partnering with them to move things forward in a positive way together rather than doing for. And so I, um, uh, we played a tiny little trick um, at the beginning, um, the, for, the takeaways as listed originally really are putting the quote unquote norm or the unstated norm, which may be white, middle class, um, uh, educated to some degree, uh, this gender, I'm, I can go on and make this up, but um, Instead of saying, you know, how do, we how do we ensure that we reflect the diverse populations they are meant to serve? How do we uh, move forward with sensitivity to issues like gender identity and expression, or with sensitivity to issues such as racial and ethnic diversity? How do we actually reflect the diversity of the, po um, of the population? So it's, um, the, po the population is diverse in and of itself, and we are a part of that diversity. The diversity is not coming into us. We are all adding to that diversity. Um, and then similarly, how do we accurately capture and reflect gender identity and expression so that my gender identity and expression is not the norm, it's part of the whole. And finally, how do we act accurately capture and reflect race and ethnicity um, and ability rather than um, being sensitive to, to those concerns? We all have race, ethnicity, and, ident and ability. How do we make uh, space at the table um, for everyone to define what that looks like? So I will stop there and uh, pass it on to, I believe, to Tally. To Tally. Hi, Tally. Hi. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, if we'll go on to the next two slides, unless you want to talk about these two real quickly, Camille. I'm good. No. So I'll go ahead and start on. Um, Website Accessibility and Inclusion. Hello, everyone. It is exciting to be talking um, to you today. Um, real quickly, what I'm going to discuss is um, more brass tacks about um, websites and accessibility, particularly for people with disabilities. I'm going to talk about why make websites accessible, how to get started, what are the basics, what are some lessons learned that we have from um, our work on OlmstedRights.org, and specifically, um, my work as an attorney who doesn't have a lot of um, technical experience but had a dream, wanted to build a website, and wanted it to be accessible. And then um, some of the top tips that I have. Um, why accessibility and inclusion? First of all, it is the law. Um, 
that um, we are um, as um, we're required under the Americans with Disabilities Act to provide reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities. And um, there's also something called Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Now that um, particular uh, provision does not apply to most of us um, because it requires um, that um, all people who are receiving um, federal contracts um, essentially make their websites uh, accessible, but it does not um, apply to most um, grantees such as um, TIG grantees such as us. But just because we don't have to do it under the law doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, we're just under the more general requirement to, to ensure that we provide reasonable accommodations. Another reason is to expand reach. 20% 20, 20 of website users have an impairment, including 10% um, of men are colorblind. That's a huge percentage of your, the people that you're trying to reach out to. And it's probably even more uh, for those of us who work in, uh, with low-income communities because um, so, uh, the great percentage, uh, the majority of people with disabilities um, are um, in, low, in the low-income communities. So it's a, a higher percentage um, in our uh, reach. Uh, it also promotes inclusion. Everything Camille talked about is a reason why you want to um, make your websites accessible, inclusive, but not only that, you want to make them inviting. One of the really exciting things about the whole world that Apple and the iPhone and all of the others who have done similar things um, with technology have shown us that things that um, are really neat to look at and that make a, um, a, 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 a easy to use um, are often much more accessible and inclusive. And um, so there's a, a lot we can do that um, also just makes the world a better place um, and makes it much more inviting. And, and so, so Kelly, it makes our there's a great better. question yeah. here from Jillian, which is, um, is there a place where we can find out details about breakdown of impairments seen amongst the population beyond uh, color blindness? Like, where do we statistically find those things out? What, sh what are the top ones we should be designing for? Right. So um, I, get, I will need to do a little research to get you the exact information, um, but um, certainly um, the main, I think, the main areas that we want to hit on, and Brian, you may actually have some insights on this as well, is we, we want to ensure that people who are colorblind are able to work through our website. People who are sight impaired and using um, a, a screen reader are able to use our websites. Um, and um, it, essentially, it's going to be the same as, as the general population um, that, uh, but for website inclusion, it's often going to be um, sight and hearing that are going to be um, sort of the main things you want to um, be aware of. But also, um, you know, one of my clients had um, used, um, he was uh, quadriplegic and um, used a mouth stick and, um, to basically um, do all of his web travel but he became quadriplegic in the early 70s, was not able to move below the head, and the Internet opened up a whole new world to him that was completely unavailable to him because he had such difficulty traveling around um, and moving around. But once um, he was able to communicate with people on the computer, use his mouth stick, he was able to uh, – um, one of the things he loved to do was to help other veterans apply for veteran benefits and he was able to do all sorts of communicating and working with people through technology. So one of the really exciting things is that for people who are often left out or isolated, um, the Internet and technology really opens up a whole new world. But I'll have to get you the statistics, uh, Jillian and everyone. I can do that and get it out to everyone. Yeah, the, a lot slide. of the W3C standards um, are really designed to hit as many of those as, 
as possible. Um, so Bobby 508 is a good starting point, but W3C standards are also really, really good on the accessibility side. Right, and that's what we're going to talk about mostly is the, is the WCAG. So um, where to start? Brian uh, just spoke, and he um, helped develop a guide that I still think is a great guide because it um, essentially just breaks down the essential requirements um, and um, specifically um, separates it into four categories that we want our websites to be perceivable. We want them so that everyone can perceive um, what they're seeing on a website. Um, that we want to be operable. We want everything on the website to be um, functional for every person who uses the website. We want it to be understandable, and we want it to be robust. And um, the, the guidelines pretty much follow this, this categorical order. So um, Section 508 versus WCAG um, 2.0, there's two different um, sets of requirements. Um, the, main requirement that, that we follow with Olmstead Rights and, and that Brian was also talking about are the, um, the 2.0 guidelines, which were created by the Worldwide Consortium, um, the Website Accessibility Initiative. And um, it's primarily for, for people with disabilities who use assistive technologies. Um, but Section 508 also has its very specific um, requirements um, that are for purchases by federal agencies. So here are the, the main um, recommendations um, from WCAG, um, text alternatives for non-text content. This is super easy. You basically, um, uh, we use Pro Bono Net platform. Um, you basically go to the picture and open it up and type in content for the text alternative, or you go into text alternative and say what the picture is so that a screen reader can tell a person what is on the picture. Now, one of the things we had some confusion about and um, we had some issues are is when do you describe what a picture is and when do you tell the screen reader just to skip the picture? And um, you can tell a screen reader to skip a picture by simply putting in quote, quote, and um, that will tell the screen reader that it doesn't need to, to, to uh, read that picture or tell any, someone about that picture. So. This picture that's on this page right here is basically decorative. It doesn't really serve a function to tell the story or, or, or give, convey enough information that a person needs to know it. So if it's mostly decorative, you don't need, um, you can just do the quote quote and have the screen reader um, skip it. If it's, a, if it's conveying important information that the person needs to have in order to understand what's on the web page, then you need to put in um, the alt text as to what it is. Um, captioning, this is so easy, especially if you use YouTube. Anytime you have a video, um, you need to caption it. And um, I find that the, easy, the absolutely easiest way to do it is to use uh, the YouTube captioning function. Um, there are plenty of um, videos out there to describe how to do it, but it's pretty self-explanatory when you go onto YouTube, put a video. The main thing is don't let YouTube just caption your video for you because it will have all sorts of gobbledygook words in there that um, its technology has tried to interpret what the words are, are saying. It doesn't do a super bad job, but it doesn't do nearly a, a good enough job. What, we, what I did was I had a high school intern who really wanted a good college um, reference, and she <laughs> certainly deserved it because she did a great job on all sorts of things for our website. But one of the things is that she did was caption all of our videos. And she had a great time doing it. And she got a great reference, and she started at Dartmouth about a week and a half ago. Um, create content that can be read by different devices is obviously what we've talked about already, but um, it's really essential for all devices to be able to read um, your content. Make content visually and audibly distinguishable. Um, the visually distinguishable is, is really critical with um, uh, the different colors. There's a wonderful tool that I think I list later in, the, on, in this presentation, the WAVE tool, where you can go and basically um, put your color scheme um, on um, their page, basically have it go look at your website. Or if you haven't created it, one of the things we did was we, we put it, made it a Google Doc and then put that Google Doc web page 
um, through the Wave tool and have it look at the color contrast because it's essential that you have the color contrast in a way that a person who's colorblind can, can read all of the content and see all of the content. Make it all functionally, functionality available from the keyboard. It is um, essential that um, a person who is going to use a, a keyboard to move around your website as opposed to a mouse is able to do that. And one of the things we learned was that it's, it's important to have your H1, H2, H3 to use that in order. I sort of liked the design and the look of H3 better than H2, and so I was trying to use that. Um, and that was not what I was supposed to do. Um, also, um, that also affects how Google um, crawls your website. And so also if you're using Google AdWords, uh, it's important to use your H1s and H2s in the proper way. Um, you want to make uh, sure the content um, doesn't cause seizures. One of the things is, is basically flashing pictures. You want to make sure um, that your content is not moving so quickly that it's going to cause a seizure. Um, make sure all users can navigate from where they are. So um, it's much easier to get around if, you, if you're using a mouse tool, but if you're using a keyboard, you want to be able to make sure that you that that everything on your web page, you can get to the next page and everywhere else you want to go. You want to make the web pages predictable. You want to help users avoid and correct mistakes and um, maximize compatibility. So my top ten, my top five tips. So the things that I think you really want to really make sure you do, no matter what, is um, your alt um, imaging your text. Um, the captioning, which I want to stress again, is so easy. Your color contrast, which you can use the Wave tool for. And on that, and I'm going to say this later, planning early really makes a difference. We um, had um, a, a graphic designer help us with some of our icons, and then we figured out that some of the color contrasts on them um, didn't work where we had some words. They weren't exactly icons, but they were words that um, showed the different web pages, and it looked beautiful, but it didn't have the correct color contrast, and it was not easy to go back and change that. It's much easier to make those decisions before you get a graphic designer to, to do these things. Um, the shifting images is what causes the seizures. We had a really neat thing where we would have um, the pictures change one after another. Um, which I loved because we have great pictures on our website, but um, it turned out that that didn't fit within the accessibility guidelines. So what we did and what you can often do is come up with an alternative. So we have a, a way to just uh, click to the right and you can change the picture yourself. Um, and then the formatting, making sure that um, a person using the arrows on the keyboard can move around your website. It shouldn't just be um, the technical technology accessibility. It's also essential to use inclusive language. Um, people first language is the term um, that the disability community and the larger community use for um, describing people with disabilities. It is quicker to say disabled and it is offensive to say that because um, it, 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 it takes the person out of um, the the language. And when I first heard this, I have to admit, when I was a new employee at Walt Disney World, um, and they told me about this in the early 90s, I didn't get it. But the more I've worked with the disability, uh, people in the disability community, the more um, I have um, really come to understand the reasons for the language. It is essential. So get yourself a people first language guide. Make sure you're using people first language. and. Um, it, sometimes it can be a little wonky, especially if you're working on an article, but it is so essential um, to, to people with disabilities, their friends, and the larger community. Um, also, use pictures that include people with disabilities just like you use pictures for all other diversity. We had a picture party. I ordered pizza, and um, we had about 30 of my friends with disabilities and without disabilities come together, and we had, um, cr had a photographer come. She volunteered. We took pictures all around Decatur, Georgia, and these pictures um, populate our website and have really given the website a lot of pizzazz in, in addition to making it inclusive. So I encourage you with the communities you're using, but also uh, that you're working with, but also the larger community to really use as much diversity in your photographs 
um, and, and to do the things that Camille has already discussed. So my, my quick lessons, um, number one is plan ahead. The more you can decide to be accessible early on, the easier it is. My um, analogy is that it costs a ton of money to put an elevator in a house after you've built the house to make the house more accessible. But if you build the house with the elevator inside at the moment you build it, it's a lot cheaper. It is so much easier to make your website accessible if you've thought through all of these things ahead of time rather than after the fact. Um, a lot of these tips are pretty easy to follow. When you get into the minutia and the, the real details of ensuring that your website is accessible, that's where code matters. That, that's where the platform you're using matters. Um, we hired and budgeted in our budget um, an accessibility expert who would review our website. She's done two audits, um, and we also prepared um, as best we could pro bono net that this was an important thing. So the platform um, that we were going to need to come back and ensure that things were accessible. And that was really essential because um, Pro Bono Net has um, access to parts of our website that we don't have access to. And so having that communication ahead of time really makes sense. And then also include time for corrections. Um, find people who know this stuff to talk it out, evaluate and reevaluate, and um, I suggest getting an audit. So um, those are our main tips. If you want more information, these are um, just some, some websites you can go to. It includes the WAVE tool that I talked about as well as um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is pretty easy to read the second time you read it. The first time you read it, you don't really understand what you're reading. The second time you read it, you sort of get it. So read it more than once. And also go to um, Brian's Ellison Tap Guide to Accessibility. And uh, I thank everyone. I think we'll do questions at the end, so I'll turn it over to Xander. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm just going to pause for just a second and make sure that there aren't any questions or anything that Jillian or Brian wants to read out from the chat box on Tally's, on Tally's piece. I'm going to assume that that's a no, and if, can folks uh, hear me? Just, okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, hey Xander, it's Jillian. I just, I just wanted to um, call out one comment really quick that I pushed through for the community. Um, I know that um, there's been a larger focus in the past few years on mobile optimizing sites. Uh, I just, what I've seen anecdotally is that many of the changes that can be done to make your site more accessible can actually be done in conjunction to make your, your site uh, mobile optimized. So for example, um, you can change, you can go in, the, the most apt example I can think of is with your images that you're uploading onto your site. Um, you can go in and oftentimes with content management systems, you're editing the image, all aspects of the image. You can go in and put in, make sure that the alt language is in there, and then you can also go ahead and um, change the width um, in the HTML code. You can um, update it it so that the, the width is um, mobile responsive. So instead of putting in a set width, you can change the width to 100% so that it adjusts to the screen size. So um, just wanted to flag um, that if you're thinking about um, web accessibility, you can also think about mobile optimization at the same time. Absolutely, and thank you so much. I think that, you know, Tally's um, metaphor of building a house with an elevator rather than putting an elevator in is a really apt one. And another thing to just think about is if you're doing reconstruction on a house, putting an elevator in while you're already doing work can really save you time and money as well. Um, so just sort of things to kind of think about a little bit. Um, and thank you so much. Um, my name is Xander Karsten. I'm a project manager at Legal Server, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about gender and online content creation. Before we get into that, um, I just wanted to call out uh, Camille and her really great um, at the top of the presentation, while she was talking, she used a phrase that I am assuming that m uh, many of you are may not be familiar with, um, cisgender or cissexual. Um, I also just use the abbreviation cis, and it describes, and I pulled it up quite honestly on Wikipedia, um, 
but um, the definition that I actually think is a pretty apt one is that it relates to types of gender identities um, and gender identity perceptions um, where an individual's experience of their own gender agrees with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, and yep, and it's, it's, uh, it, it is CIS. There was a question that came through about the um, about the spelling. And the reason that I thought that it was a really good sort of place to start is that we don't oftentimes think about gender as applying to people who are not either self-identified as women or who are not trans. And what I like about this particular definition of cisgender um, is that it really talks about a set of gender identities, that there's more than one, um, with, even within the cis community, that gender is this really multifaceted and multi-layered construct that we have that we think of as a very basic part of our lives, of the information that we share about ourselves, either verbally or non-verbally, um, and information that, and this is what we'll sort of focus on, we are all entitled to know. And that's sort of one of the underlying kind of precepts that we have is that gender is something that we are all entitled to know about one another. And when that becomes unclear or when those lines become crossed, we get very, either very defensive, uncomfortable, um, a whole range of emotions and, and responses. Um, and sort of the, as we're thinking about our work and our approaches to our work, I think it's really important to, re to think about those underlying assumptions that we make, not only about somebody's gender, but also about our right to know that about them. Um, and also just to put out there that Again, you know, this is entitled gender and cultural competency and legal technology. Um, and when and that oftentimes conjures visuals of people who are not cisgender um, in particular, that we use that word gender in a lot of ways to describe things that are not the default. And the default is so often cis folks, which, you know, it's default. Um, but when we're thinking about this in our own work, that is an assumption that we really need to examine so that we really have a, um, a truly inclusive uh, approach to the work that we do. Um, so today we're going to kind of go over a set of um, a variety of things. The first thing that we're going to talk about is asking about gender um, and really, again, why, what are we asking and why are we asking it? Um, how how online platforms ask for gender into the um, in the sort of taking that abstract into more of a physical into more of sort of a tools how other platforms ask for gender um, and different examples um, and then looking at gendered language and this particularly came out of uh, the need to use gender neutral language in forms um, but it can really in can really impact how we write for our audiences um, and then sort of other consideration when creating online tools so what are you asking when you're asking about someone's gender and again this is you know there are a couple of things and i think that the context of online learning and online spaces really forces us to think about what is the information that we need and what is the information that we're asking for? Oftentimes we rely, in, when we're in person, on the ability to clarify, on, on um, nonverbal cues to really allow the person that we're talking about to understand we may be asking you know, a stock question and allows us to really figure out, like, to really get from that person the information we're actually looking for, even though we're using stock questions. On online spaces, we don't have that, um, we really don't have the ability to do that. We really need to think about this, um, how we're asking for, I mean, all, all points of information, um, but really to clarify and crystallize what, what the exact information that we need is and being able to ask that in a respectful way. Um, so some options when people ask about other people's genders, what they're oftentimes asking, and obviously, again, it depends on the context, um, but 
they could be asking what pronoun a user prefers, what gender we can check for our funders, or um, when we're trying to figure out what funder, what um, grant people may fit under, um, what grant if they fit those grant criteria, um, what is the gender that the user identifies with or as, um, what gender marker is used on someone's legal documents. Um, the other thing that people are asking, and it's really important to understand that what, you're, what people really are asking when somebody asks, are you male, female, check one? is you're asking about somebody's primary sexual characteristics, and we've used the shorthand to ask for all the other things, all those other four things um, in, in one, but that one can be a real problem for a lot of people and a really intrusive question. So if you have a situation where, whether it's on, in an online um, scenario or in real life, um, and you need to know somebody's pronoun or you need to know um, what gender somebody um, identifies as so that you can report that to your funders. Those are re really specific questions that can be teased out and can be explained um, without sort of getting swept up into this idea of a um, what, you know, what sex or what gender are you um, with a limited number of responses. And it is true that those responses and, you know, sort of the boxes that you can check are ever expanding. Um, we'll talk about a couple of examples in the future, but really when you're approaching, um, when you're approaching this, really thinking about what are you asking and crystallizing that. And I, you know, I'm a really visual person. I tend to crystallize that in, um, you know, on a document, just trying to figure out, going through each of those um, intake forms or um, demographic forms and really circling them and say, this piece of data maps to this reason for asking it. And if there's not a reason, if your funders don't require it, if you don't need to know a pronoun for a user, if you don't need to know what gender marker is on a user's legal documents, then you don't need to ask it. It's not something that, you know, you need to know. Oftentimes it comes sort of pre-populated in these base setup forms, um, but they're not always mapped to reasons for asking that. So just being aware of that. I am a visual person. I really, I really like flowcharts. Um, so again, do you need to know a, a user's gender? If the answer is no, you don't have to ask. Um, again, if the answer is yes, then really thinking through why, why you need that. And that answer to why you need it dictates the real question that you're going to ask that person um, or the user group that you're talking to. So these are my, these are some suggestions. They are my suggestions. If you'll notice the asterisks with the really big red uh, arrow. And then at the bottom, these are only my suggestions. They're not legal servers suggestions. They're not pro bono not suggestions. They're not LSN tap suggestions. They're not join me as suggestions. Um, and most importantly, they are not the suggestions of the entire trans community. When putting this together, one of the reasons that I don't do a trans 101 um, and talk about sort of, you know, identities, et cetera, is that in, in many ways, I am a white trans guy who's lived on two different coasts and I have a very specific experience. That is not the experience of trans folks or folks in general who live in the Midwest, people of color, um, people who are younger or older than I am, and all of those things really, really matter in terms of language. If you are looking at this and, these, and this is the first time you have heard things like cisgender or trans or any of these other adjectives, that is absolutely fine. And, and I think that it's great that you're on the call. Um, and the next step is really, and even if you're very aware of these things, um, your next step when really making your, um, when making your forms or really establishing your presence is to go to your local LGBT community center to get educated on what the trans community in your community really looks like. Um, and if you need help doing that, feel free to email me. I'm always happy to you know, hook folks up. Um, 
but these are just my suggestions and I really I have been in the situation where I have been told as a consumer that somebody somewhere at some point told the builder of a form or of a website that this was an okay way to include trans folks and I look at that and I say that it's not an okay way. Um, be aware of your local community and it's really a local community um, and it's communities. There's more than one um, and you know having strong partnerships with your local um, LGBT groups or centers can really be helpful. We'll talk a little bit about testing at the end um, but just sort of to make to make folks aware of that. So for example, um, so if you need to know a user's pronoun and reasons that you may need that is to make um, an interface easier to navigate funding purposes. Um, transparency is always really great. Um, for example, to make this process easier, please provide a pronoun, um, he, him, she, um, she, her, and then please provide a, personally just as a point of, um, just as a point of etiquette, other is othering. Um, when there's, you know, two or three or four options and then there's an other, uh, especially when you're talking about demographic information, it can really, um, you know, it's not best practices, you can get away with it, um, but I like, you know, sort of please provide or specify or other words um, like that. Um, another example can be we collect some demographic information for funding. What pronouns do you use? And, you know, what I like about both of these is that it tells the person why you're collecting the information and it asks for the information that you really want and that you're asking for. Um, if you need to know a user's gender identity, um, for example, it's material to the user to the user's legal issue, um, or again for funding purposes, uh, what gender do you identify as? Or we're collecting some demographic information for funding. What gender do you identify as? Um, you can do this one, um, and you can do any of these sort of in any way that you know your um, your office um, wants to. I like an open text box when talking about somebody's gender identity. We'll talk about Facebook in a, just a second. Um, they changed uh, 50 options in their drop down for somebody's identity was not enough. Um, and granted, that is a different use case than this one. Um, but think about and, and really, you know, investigate and rather than oftentimes these offerings get really dismissed out of hand, but really think about what would the ramifications be if you did provide an open text box. Talk to your funders about what would it mean if you provided a variety of um, a variety of responses to these questions. Um, how how would that work out? And it may be that at the end of the day, that's not a possibility. But you know, this is one of those things that you can do uh, due diligence on in you know not a lot of time and make your presence so much more trans inclusive. Um, the last one is that you need to know the gender marker on somebody's legal documents. Um, and this happens. This happens with um, pro programs, especially that are doing any kind of name change or gender or gender. Um, marker document change. Um, so, and in this case, you know, what is the sex on your birth certificate or court order, um, male, female. There are other, obviously, you know, this is a very um, select group of examples, um, but just, you know, some things to sort of get those thoughts flowing and really starting to think about what you're asking for and how. So some examples from other online platforms. So Facebook, um, and this actually has to be updated, um, when I put this together, it provided users um, over 50, 50 gender identities in a drop down, um, which was really great and really, you know, just um, made national headlines. Everybody heard about it. It was really great. Um, and then they later changed that to just an open text box. So people could really specify their own gender identity, um, which again was, you know, was a really, really represented a major shift in how, um, and how they, and how these um, online platforms were asking for um, things like gender. And then what they did for advertisement purposes, because they still needed to, I mean, their interface requires pronouns, but in reality, we know that it was ad revenue that, you know, 50 plus or you know an infinite number of gender identity options does not make for good sellable data um, and so what they did was they sold um, ads 
they sold advertisers how what somebody's gender pronoun was. Um, of which you're allowed three options. There's male, there's he, she, there's he, she, and then other. Um, and they use a they for the, for the other, um, which, you know, allowed is not perfect, um, but I'm not sure that there is necessarily a perfect in these situations, especially when we're talking about online. Um, but it allowed them to both honor their users' gender identities um, as well as provide the ad revenue that they needed um, for for their website. Uh, Groove Shark, which is defunct and used to be one of my more favorite um, music um, music sites, has identity language, which I really like. Um, so it allowed, you know, you put in your name and then here's a small screenshot of the date of your birth. And then I identify as, um, which, you know, I really liked as both an active as well as a descriptive um, descriptive language rather than saying I am X or Y, this is an identity because this is an identity. Um, you know, that idea of saying that you, somebody is something talks to an immutable characteristic. Um, gender is not immutable and um, really depends on the identity of the person who's carrying the gender. So you've determined sort of what information you're seeking. Um, you've determined if you need that information at all. Um, and you've decided what, if any, questions you're going to ask. And so what's sort of the next step? So this is, you know, um, flowcharts run amok. So ne gender neutral language. Um, and there's a pretty easy, um, pretty easy decision tree where if you are responding to a specific person and you know that person's preferred pronoun, then you use that person's preferred pronoun. Um, basically, in every other situation, you use gender neutral language. And you can use gender neutral language even when you know someone's preferred pronoun and you're referring to a specific person. It's really when done well and when there's real thought um, put into writing in a gender neutral way, um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't appear as stilted or as cumbersome as oftentimes um, it's made out to be, where you know, suddenly you have to replace everything with they. Um, that's not necessarily you know, the case. And um, we'll talk about a couple of um, really interesting examples in just a second. So what to change and what to avoid. So um, again, focus on the substance or function rather than the gender. Um, use formal titles rather than gendered prefixes. And again, avoid using pronouns unless you are referring to someone whose pronouns you actually know. Um, and you have more options than they or their or the S in parentheses HE, which we oftentimes see. So this was listed directly from a um, another article. The citation is in the um, is in the slide deck, um, which will be available. But um, this person has rewritten this uh, sentence in a couple of different ways, just to highlight a few um, a few of the different um, ways that you can make a sentence gender neutral. Um, you can make the noun plural. Um, and in this case, they did use um, the their um, convention, so a lawyer must diligently represent their client. Um, you can repeat the noun, um, so a lawyer must diligently represent that lawyer's client. Um, you can omit the pronoun completely, which I really like because I like shorter sentences. Um, a lawyer must diligently represent clients. Um, and my, and actually my favorite, especially when we're writing instructions for, um, for individuals, a lawyer, as a lawyer, you must diligently represent your client as a way to not only avoid, use gender neutral language, but to also really engage the reader in a different way that they may not necessarily see um, otherwise. So there are options that are out there. Um, it does become, you know, a fun, just sort of intellectual exercise. Um, but 
So other considerations um, when you are thinking through making your online presence um, as gender in as inclusive um, to folks as humanly possible, um, content testing and engaging in underserved communities to do user testing. Um, number one, there's a really excellent um, LSN ta uh, web user testing guide, website user testing guide on LSN TAP. Um, I, in full disclosure, I think is excellent in part because I co-authored it, um, but I still think it's really great. Um, and so if you haven't been thinking through doing user testing throughout your project, it's, this is a really great sort of way to start or place to start. Um, there are these things called, you know, A-B tests where you have sort of one construction um, and a um, and another sentence construction and people can just choose which one sort of speaks to them um, and this is a really great space to um, to really look at engaging with your local LGBT um, chapters and getting their input and getting real user input um, around um, around your web presence and the trans community in particular because for because information is so hard to get and is hard to come by and many of us live isolated in rural communities technology and the internet and computer use is something that we're pretty adept at um, and you know if you really look to engage um, co community groups that in turn um, engage with their um, engage with the trans community you can get a ready-made um, group of testers to do a variety of testing um, including looking at um, being gender inclusive um, and then much as Tally talked about, you know, what are the faces you're using in your outreach? Um, are they really, are they reflective of the communities that you want using your materials? And are they all the communities that you want um, in using your, um, using your services? And also looking at where you're providing your outreach. Um, if you are providing outreach services in just a few sort of niche spaces, um, you may be you may be missing great opportunities that you can um, really get other folks to come in and and use your services or use your forms or use your online intake or whatever that project is for you. So just sort of general um, tips as as we look to um, wrap up, um, be obvious about how the information is going to be used. If you're going to use that information to, for example, create an avatar or to plead or to be pled in an actual case or for funding purposes, um, be really transparent with folks who are um, entering that information. Um, there have been a couple of forms that I've used specifically with um, the trans community where, for example, when you set the avatar, it has no bearing on what is pled, but, and, but people still routinely choose the avatar of the gender they were assigned at birth rather than the gender that they identify as because they're worried or nervous that it's going to it's going to really impact the outcome of the pleading and it's you know and it is and those are two separate things but it's not always clear that those are two separate things and even though oftentimes the pushback that you know i get is that these are not you know when we're talking about somebody who is facing a eviction this may not be you know the most pressing issue those little things those small things to let folks know that you have thought through this as an agency and that their experiences as in this case trans people but and the variety of identities is really important to you as an agency says volumes and really changes the in, the interactions and the relationships that individuals and communities can have with your agency so even if it is something you know just to create an avatar if that avatar has no bearing if the gender of that avatar has no bearing on the outcome of the documents that they're gonna uh, produce it's worth mentioning that um, also thinking about, again, 
what you actually need and only ask for that. Um, we know that gender especially, um, but also race, also ethnicity, um, these are all things that have become really standard on all of our forms. And when we need to ask it, when we're tracking it for specific reasons, whether that's for, whether that's privately, um, for funders, whether that's because you wanna see the impact that you have in um, a particular community, that's great. But just make sure that you're thinking through that, that you're not just asking that because that's the default on the form. Um, and then if you, if you are asking, be open to options. Um, and also make it easy to change that information. When we're talking about things like case management systems where you may have a client who is, you know, who comes back multiple times, making sure that it is easy to change the gender on somebody's, um, on somebody's form, making, it, making sure that it is easy um, to really be responsive to conditions that are changing in that client's life is really important. Um, oftentimes, you know, we don't ask and we don't ask everybody, um, especially when it's an in-person rather than an online, but we're entering information into um, into the case management system and, you know, even if it's somebody who's come, and especially when it's somebody who's come back multiple times, people just skip that. Um, and that's really, it's really telling not only for the person for whom that's skipped, um, who doesn't get asked that question, but also in contrast, who does get asked that question. Um, and it says something really specific about um, about those clients, um, depending on which um, they get, you know, kind of shuffled into, and really thinking about, you know, asking at every point, you know, if you are going to ask about someone's gender identity, making sure that that is consistent across all clients, whether they're new or returning, um, can be really, really important. Yeah, and so that, that was my last slide. If folks have um, more questions or if folks want to call out comments that have been made on the chat, that would be great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Xander, and uh, thank you, Camille and Tally, as well. Um, it's a lot of good information and for those interested. Uh, the recording will be available along with the materials um, on the LSNTAP website, I believe. And um, as Xander mentioned, there's a lot of uh, activity in our chat box, so you'll see some links to uh, resources mentioned uh, during the call that you can check out here, um, and I guess we can start to, to go through questions. Yeah, so please feel free to type questions in either the chat box or star six to unmute yourself. Uh, to bring forward questions. Um, we've got a, a, a lot of them here also. Um, uh, for people who tried a little bit earlier, the LSNTAP website was down. We were able to get it back up and I'm getting those links put into the chat and I'll have a link to the um, slides here in just a second. And there was one actually um, from Caroline uh, Robinson and Mass Legal um, that asked if I was saying that we assume we are entitled to know the gender of others or, in, or that we are in fact entitled. And I'm saying that we assume that we are entitled to know, that that's not something that we are necessarily entitled to know, but there's an assumption there that, you know, that's public information. So just to clarify. Um, and feel free to ask questions of Xander or any of our panelists. Um, I see another question in the chat box that was discussed but I don't think was answered orally, so I just wanted to read it out. Um, is there a preference suggestion for using disability versus differently abled, et cetera, or does it depend? Um, can you repeat it one more time? I think I understand it. Sure. Is there a preference suggestion for using disability versus differently abled, et cetera, or does that depend? I, I don't know the, the full answer to that. I think that um, it, there is a lot of um, question about the use of the word dis disability because it really focuses on impairment. It's also sort of just the, the language people know and use. So um, 
I think that um, that my concern about the word differently abled is that it still puts the sort of the D at the end and it, it still sort of labels the person. Um, it's an interesting question I don't, I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I still sort of prefer using people first language, so I'd probably say something that would sound a little awkward of a person, person with different abilities or something like that um, mm -hmm. rather than differently abled. And yeah, I'm definitely with uh, Tally Hello. there. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi. Good. I was on mute for a second and could figure it out. I actually wanted to, um, I, I put a couple of comments there, but um, I think uh, two things. One, um, people first, I think, is the right, is the right answer. Um, with differently abled, I think there was a period in like the 80s or 90s or somewhere, or maybe late, yeah, maybe in the 90s, um, that uh, where I know that that got into my language. And so um, I put in the chat that I, you know, welcome correction because I think that it's what I found in my interpersonal relation um, interactions with folks is that folks who are very comfortable and confident in being disabled and, be, and um, identify with, and I'm going to make all sorts of mistakes here, so I'm just putting it, putting it forward, to model the fact that we have to sort it out amongst people who can have conversations, because if we never make mistakes, we'll never figure it out. Um, but uh, the, the differently abled piece, I think, is part generational, and I think part um, the reaction to folks who, in my background, did not want to be called disabled or, or referred to as people with a disability. They're like, no, I'm whatever. But I follow, I, I stand corrected and will go with people with uh, disabilities or people with different abilities. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, people who are, who are disabled or people with disabilities. Is that like the right, is that sort of where the, the common um, understanding is? Yeah, I think just using the people first language. I, I sent around something that we have, I mean, there's lots of different people first guides. I sent around one guide that we have here in Georgia. Um, yeah, and Brian, you were going to say something about it? Um, I, I would definitely say that the people first language is the um, preferred in, in the community by far. Um, and think of it as um, we don't refer to somebody as having a visual disability when they have glasses. We refer to them as having glasses or someone with a wheelchair. So it's, it's the even the disability part of the language is removed at this point and we're more uh, descriptive of a person and how they interact with the world. So like a person who uses a wheelchair. And, and yeah. also choosing when it's necessary to even use that description, I think gets also back to, um, you know, I, I, is there a reason to, to use that term? Um, in the law, sometimes like Xander was talking about in his presentation, there are, there's going to be a specific reason. If you're applying for disability benefits, you've got to show that the person has a disability. In my world where I work with the Americans with Disabilities Act, it only applies if the person has a disability. So it's important to indicate why the person meets the eligibility criteria. But lots of times when you're describing someone, you just don't need to, get, to go there. Something else that's really kind of cool recently is that the, there's been a movement to change the symbol of disability so that it's not this sort of static wheelchair, it's an active wheelchair um, with a person in it who is moving and, um, and it's much more, it's just much more empowering. And I think some of those symbols um, can also be really powerful. Um, and then there gets into the whole whole sort of pride movement where disability is also um, where a person with a disability is, is has a pride march or something like that where that you would talk about the dis that person with a disability because they're proud of it and so it very much depends on the context. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the disability symbol. Uh, there's a somewhat related question in the chat box. What about images? There are traditional images for male, stick figure, female, stick figure wearing a skirt, disability, person in wheelchair. Is there a preference or suggestion for those and whether those are considered culturally humble? Or again, does it depend on the communities you work with? 
So this is Xander, um, and I just wanted to, the symbol of sort of the male stick figure with no dress and the female stick figure with a dress, which is really the only difference, um, is oftentimes really connected with um, bathrooms and the lack of a gender neutral bathroom. Um, I don't think, I, I, you know, I cannot say, there are specific images that are used oftentimes just locally that do a combination or a difference within um, sort of a play on those two images, but mostly, especially nationally and et cetera, you know, we don't use those um, in any way to symbolize the trans community at large. Um, there are some, like I said, some local groups that may, um, and you may see that, see that locally. Um, Oftentimes, though, that, that's, that those images, at least as they refer and impact the trans community in particular, um, you know, are really looking, looked at segregated bathrooms, um, which is something that, you know, it's a whole nother conversation that we can have. Right. And I will, I'll share an example of, um, I guess, priming that, I mean, it, I think it's, it's a, it's a, an interesting question. I was in a uh, facilitation workshop and the materials had different images of different people, um, like cartoon sort of images. And one of the images was of a person in a wheelchair. Um, and that was a wonderful prime for me because it was normalizing and putting as like part of the, the backdrop. I, I don't usually see pictures of people in wheelchairs in something that's not specifically related to disability issues. And so that's fine, but then for folks who have other ability, I mean, who have other disabilities, people who are blind, who are deaf, who um, uh, may have, I don't know, um, mental disabilities, wheelchair doesn't speak for them. And so, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure what the what the approach is for that. But I do want to say that the idea of cultural humility is really about the process that you go through to make sure you're asking the right questions. Um, well, and this also goes to getting to know people in their communities. Um, right. And um, I think it's a great question. It's one I'm going to take back to the disability community around uh, symbols. I'm going to send everyone a, just a, a short link to an article about the. Um, new disability symbol that's um, being used, but it's certainly someone in a wheelchair. It's sort of the common, just, you know, for like parking and things like that that's used. Um, but, I, you know, I think that that's the reason you have these conversations and we all get educated and particularly we get educated about the areas that we don't focus on or the, the populations and people that we don't, aren't around as much as we should be maybe. And, and um, if I can so remind that, that, that's, oh, sorry. I was going to say that's cultural oh. humility, right? Being able to say, okay, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. What can I learn from you? As opposed to taking a defensive posture. That's another example. I think that was Brian. Sorry if I cut you off. Oh, I, I just wanted to let people know as we're getting close to the end here, we've still got a few minutes for discussion, uh, but the, um, survey is there. This has been a new topic for us. We greatly appreciate people's uh, feedback on it. Um, also, I wanted to emphasize Callie's point from earlier and uh, the usability guide that Xander put forward. It is so much easier to design these things in at the beginning. LSMTAP is always willing to take a look at a project that you're working on um, any time in the development cycle and give you feedback on um, usability or accessibility. Uh, often though, I'm brought in at the very end of a project um, in which there, someone's looking for a stamp of approval and it means redesigning major pieces. The earlier we can get involved helping out on the feedback side, the less it's gonna cost in development time to make things accessible, usable, um, and to really embed these best practices into a project. Well, I'm grateful that this topic was, was raised and it, it was um, fantastic to discuss it. And I do also want to give a shout out, um, Jillian put it 
in um, a, a comment, but you know, Pro Bono Net has just been fabulous to work with on um, the accessibility and. Um, and I think that one of the things that all of us fear is doing it wrong, but it's much easier to, to, to move forward if we just get into it and make the mistakes along the way and, and, and fix them than to just stand back and not do them. Absolutely. And just really to sort of both piggyback off of that and also um, answer one question, there was a question that came in about, you know, when you have something like a government form where there are only that, you know, you're helping people navigate um, through an online tool, like how do you explain, especially when they're not your forms, um, the lack of options and, you know, something just to think about as a default um, is just being transparent about what's happening and usually sort of the honest answer is the simplest and oftentimes allows you to really tailor that to be, um, to be the best and, you know, for example, like this government form only provides two options for gender, gender or gender identity. It you know identifies it as a as the gov as a government form as a form that's not yours, um, and also sort of acknowledges its limitations. And I think you know for a lot of us, you know we we educate ourselves and we really you know do our best to do right by these communities. Um, and to just be really transparent about, um, you know, about what those limitations are and about, um, you know, all of those efforts to really, you know, try to be as um, cognizant as possible. Thanks, Sandra. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I know that Caroline had a question. She wanted to remind us about plain language, easy reading, and translations some of the best resources out there for plain language. Um, it has definitely helped us also when de um, designing things for our mobile. Um, plain language has been very useful there also for just being concise. And it, and it certainly helps with accessibility as well. That's a great point. And I mean, and the one thing that I will say is, you know, especially around things like gender neutral language, et cetera, a lot of the pushback is that it makes things um, harder to read and sort of um, not in plain language. And for folks who, you know, who really see that and think that, see that as a challenge. I mean, there are ways that you can make this accessible and easy to read and easy to understand. And it is true that there may be, a, you know, a couple of words here and there that are a little bit inside baseball, if you will. Um, but, you know, that, and that really is the, the challenge um, and the challenge of, making sure that we are inclusive. It's not necessarily easy. It's worth the time and it's worth the effort, but it does take, you know, real thought and it can absolutely be done. So I just sort of wanted to put that out there because that is a piece that I get sort of pushed back on a lot. Um, but and also, just really quickly, if you're doing stuff around gender, gender things within and looking to translate that, again, make sure you get input from your local communities that are speakers of the language um, within the trans community, because not everything translates all the time. So just putting that out there. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, or thank you everyone so much for putting on this uh, presentation today. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, thank you, Pro Bono Net, for organizing this and all the speakers.